again this year to have Terry Madonna speak to us on the latest election polling data and the trends in the midterm elections. In his role as the director of the Center for Politics and Public Affairs at Franklin and Marshall College in the Franklin and Marshall College poll. My pleasure now to introduce Jane Brennan, who will introduce Terry. Thank you, Paul. a little bit short in the interest of your time. Whatever you want to uh, do. It's been said that in Philadelphia, the only thing more common than sports and war analogies in political reporting is quotes from Terry Madonna. <laughs> Terry Madonna is a professor, a pollster, a pundit, an author, and a good friend to believe. He's been here several times. That's right to speak to us. Um, as far as his teaching responsibilities, he, his interests focus on the American presidency, American political parties and political behavior, and voting behavior. You probably all know him more as the director of the Franklin and Marshall College Poll, which is nationally and I believe internationally known. Uh, he started the Keystone Poll in 1992, and in 2008, it converted to uh, the Franklin and Marshall Poll. Um, one other thing, I'm trying to keep this short, but I did want you to be aware of the titles of his publications, which, thank you, um, are incredibly timeless. Um, in 1993, he wrote a book on reapportionment, a primer for Pennsylvanians. Um, in 1994, he wrote a book on merit selection of appellate judges, why the time has come. And then in 2008, he wrote Pivotal Pennsylvania, Presidential Politics from FDR, FDR to the 21st Century. So those seem to be timeless, especially this year. With no further ado, there you go. Carrie Madonna. Thank, thank you. Am I using this? Am I using this? Oh no, I'm going to uh, walk around. I have a microphone on my lapel, but I don't know what that's about. But at any rate, I think that's for the video. I'm, I must apologize. First of all, I'm delighted to be here as usual. I must apologize to ruin your lunch to talk about the status of American politics <laughs> at the moment. But I'm going to proceed anyway. Now here's, I'm going to ask you to do something. And as we say in Lancaster County, it ain't going to be easy. For the next half hour, you can't be a Democrat, you can't be a Republican, you can't be a liberal, and you can't be a conservative. You got it? Another way of putting it is, welcome to my world. Uh, the world I, the, I have to live in for, because of what I do. So let's start out with this. Before we get into the specifics of this particular midterm election, let's talk about a little history. Presidents of the United States uniformly hate midterm elections for one simple reason. If you go back to 1890, not 1990, Go back to 1990, the president's party has only won three of them. And if we don't even have to go that far, let's be a little more specific and go to first midterm elections, first midterms, and go back to that guy Richard Nixon, remember him? He resigned uh, facing certain impeachment in the House of Representatives for, what was that Watergate break-in, that cover-up? I, I used to teach about that. So if we go back then and we move straight up through, you, you pick the presidents, uh, Ford, Carter, Reagan, uh, Clinton, the two Bushes, Obama, only one president has won seats in Congress in their first term. And that was George W. Bush in 2002 in the wake of the horrific 9-11 attacks when Americans rallied around the nation, the flag, if you will, the president and the Democrats, the Republicans picked up six or seven seats in the House. So presidents of the United States uniformly just simply hate midterms for the obvious reason that their party doesn't do well. And I don't have a lot of time to get into that, but more fundamentally, 
usually it's an economic problem, meaning the status of the economy. Often it's in the first term, uh, if they particularly have the houses of Congress, both houses in their favor, they'll do something that Americans typically don't like, they'll raise taxes. That certainly happened to uh, Reagan, in Reagan in 1982 faced uh, the recession. Uh, Bill Clinton, in, he lost 26 seats in the House. Bill Clinton in 1994 lost 54 seats in the House. The part economy, part taxes. And I say this to students and they look at me with eyes glazing over. I say, that was before Monica. <laughs> Do you get it? So they say, Monica who? <laughs> and then I try not to explain that, but I was sorry I brought the whole thing up at that point. And the big whopper was, of course, President Obama in 2002, when he came into office, the federal government raised a variety of taxes, and in the spring of that year, Congress passed the Affordable Care Act, which at that time was very unpopular. Now, since the efforts to repeal and replace in the polls that have been done, it's more popular than not, pushing 50, 54% in some polls, uh, otherwise, of course, known as Obamacare, and I'm glad you're seated for this, 63 seats in the House of Representatives in what was, became the Tea Party Revolution. And the nature of Congress, and as well as state legislatures like ours and others, changed in terms of the composition, the nature of the people who went in there. Typically, lawmakers in both parties would go to bring, to bring the bacon back home, to bring goodies back home, to work on whatever projects and whatever needs their districts had. That changed dramatically in 2010, both in our legislature, which over the course of the next three elections, and I know you're very interested in the Pennsylvania legislature, became, and I'm, I'm going to use conservative and liberal neutral just as descriptive, now, I'm not using them as pejorative, the Pennsylvania legislature over the next three elections became the most conservative legislature in modern Pennsylvania history. You all with me on that? Yeah. And the same thing can be said for the Federal House of Representatives. And that has to do, it, it began in 2010 in the Tea Party election. Now, there's something else to think about. Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, and Barack Obama, horrible first midterms, every one of them won well over 300 electoral votes in their bid for a second term. So I tell my Republican friends this, so there's no, if, if you all don't do well in these elections, that doesn't mean that President Trump is necessarily going to lose the presidential election in 2020. We just don't know. But three presidents who faced pretty horrific times ended up winning re-election pretty handily with the, uh, only, uh, the only votes that count, as you know, the electoral college votes. So that's point number one. Let's go to point number two. How do political scientists, how do we measure? There are a whole bunch of ways to figure out whether a party's gonna do well or not so well in a midterm. One of the indicators that, have, that has been pretty consistent over time is the president's job performance. If it's uh, above 50%, the party will do very well. If it's below 50%, it's, it, it, it's trouble. Typically, under 50%, you can look for the president to lose upward and sometimes exceeding 30 seats in the House. And depending on the Senate election, five, six, eight, maybe even up to 10. Again, depending on the situation. As we sit here, you sit here and I stand here, the last time I looked two days ago the, on the Real Clear Politics average, oh, if you have no life like I do, and you wake up every morning and before you get your breakfast, you have to find out what the hell's going on. There are a couple of sources and they don't cost any money. You could get Larry Sabato's crystal ball down at the University of Virginia. Larry's a great guy, he's a good friend of mine. You could go to Nate Silver's 538 blog. You could go to uh, Charlie Cook. He puts out something called the Cook Report. 
And then Nathan Gonzalez does Inside Elections, and you can, you can get that directly, or I usually read it on roll call. That's also free. So there's, these are great sources. Some of them get, the, Nate Silver's blog gets very, very technical in some of the models that they use to do the predictions. At any rate, the president's job performance is now at its highest point in his presidency. The last time I looked two days ago, it was 44.5% positive. President Obama's job performance on the eve of the disaster for the Democrats in 2010 was 45% positive. Reagan, Clinton, and Obama through the fall of those years, 45, 46, 47, you get it, those job performances were, were pretty miserable. So that's one indicator that we use to try to figure out whether or not uh, you know, a president and his party are in trouble in the midterm election. The, the other way to think about this is that midterm elections historically are a referendum on the president. This year, it's taken it to a new height. And I'll tell you why. In the poll that we just released, I can't lose in time. Oh, yesterday, I think it was yesterday. In the poll that we released yesterday, and other pollsters have shown the same thing, here's what's unusual about it. We know that there are issues that matter. Right now, health care in many congressional elections and statewide elections are important, and I'll explain in that context in a minute. But when we ask voters about what's it can be worded in a number of ways. Why are you voting? What's propelling you to vote? What do you care about when you vote? Here's what's unusual. In the highest percentages that I've seen, and I think since scientific polling began to track that, there's one word, Trump. The President of the United States is motivating both positive and negative responses to a degree we've not seen before. In our state, a large majority of voters in both parties are telling us, Democrats, why are you voting? Because I don't like Trump, I don't like what he's done. You give me a whole bunch of responses, but you get the point. They're motivated by desire to end the Trump presidency and for their party to pick up seats to take over Congress. And conversely, Republicans feel the same way. Republicans feel the same way. They are voting to show their support for the president and for their party to retain control of the, uh, of the Congress. So that's taken that level to a new height. And the president himself has sort of walked through this and now thinks that in the waning days of this, of this uh, campaign, that immigration is the issue largely because of the caravan, that that's likely to motivate voters, Republican voters, to come back home. Here's something that we found in the poll that we released Thursday that's really relevant to understanding what's going on. Why did Democrats have the lead in so many states? Why in Pennsylvania, all year, in every independent poll, does Governor Wolf and Senator Casey have double-digit leads? I'm going to let that sink in. Not single-digit leads. Leads in the real clear politics average for Wolf at one point were up 17. I haven't seen him since our poll, so that would probably push it up to about 18 points in his favor. And Senator Casey about 16 points. I've been doing this for 27 years, polling, and I've been doing what I do for longer than I'm going to admit. I don't know anyone in the average of the polls, and in this case we're talking about four independent polls, four, and they're essentially college polls, Marist, Suffolk, Muhlenberg, and F&M. We have no stake in the outcome. You know, we don't contribute to candidates or support parties. All four of those polls, every single one done all year, has shown Wolf and Casey with a double digit lead. Not one has shown a lead in the single digits. I'm gonna let that sink in a minute. So here's one of the factors, just one, 
Democrats are far more cohesive than Republicans. What the hell does that mean? It means Democrats are going to cast a large proportion of straight party votes this year. Republicans are far more likely to split their tickets. And of course, the biggest ticket splitting part of Pennsylvania is down here in the burbs. You have the largest group of ticket splitting voters, and I don't have to tell you because of the Democratic Republican battles that go on here in the four. 15 years ago, the Philadelphia suburbs were a wholly owned subsidiary of the Republican Party. And that's changed dramatically in the last 15 years. And I've polled in some of these. I won't get into all that. So, referendum on the president. The president has even said, it's about me. Well, why, why wouldn't Trump say it's about me? <laughs> and I don't know if I'm going to have time to get into some of the of some aspects of the of the Trump presidency but let me put it this way no other president that I know of having taught American the presidency for more years than I'm willing to admit no president I know with an economy as good as this is would not have a job performance above 50 percent it's impossible to imagine and it doesn't matter whether it started over Obama or President Obama or not. The fact of the matter is this economy has grown in virtually every indicator, whether we're talking about unemployment, 3.5, 3.6% now, GDP growth, 4.1, 4.2%, consumer confidence in, uh, at, what, a 50-year high? I just heard a report on NPR coming in about wages are now up substantially. We now have more people looking for, now, we now have more jobs posted than we have people qualified to, to, to assume them. So you can't make the case that the economy isn't good. But it's essentially a couple of things. One, and you may not believe, maybe you'll believe it. A fair number of Democrats have refused to accept the legitimacy of the outcome of 2016. One. Number two, the president's controversial, and I don't care if you're a strong supporter of his or not, even his supporters will admit this, his style and his personality get in the way of the success that the economy has, has, has grown. I mean, you, you, you can't discount that. But here's something else that I, I really, it really needs to sink in. If you go back and you look since scientific polling began in the 50s, you can't find greater differences between Democrats and Republicans and Americans in general on a whole assortment of things, regardless of what issue you want to talk about. We, we sort of dreamed up a new world. We used, word, we used to talk about or two words maybe, polarization and partisanship. Now it's hyper-partisanship and hyper-polarization. <laughs> something that we didn't use until, until recently. How about this one? Here's my favorite one. Between 70 and 80% of Democrats believe in the confirmation hearings of Brett Kavanaugh to the United States Supreme Court. They believe him. 70 to 80% of Republicans, did I say Democrats? Yes. Yeah, Republicans b believe him. 70 to 80 percent of Democrats believe Dr. Ford. And there's no consensus on almost any issue that we, we, we talk about. Yeah, I'll tell you one thing that's actually happened. There is no doubt that the Republicans have gotten more motivated because of the Brett Kavanaugh hearings. In fact, in the poll that we did, when we asked people about interest and motivation, the Kavanaugh confirmation was at the top of the list, with more than 60% of Pennsylvania voters said it made them more interested in voting. But here's what happened. The Republicans gained significantly as a result of that. And so now, just about the same number of Democrats as Republicans say they're very interested in the election. Translation, they're going to vote. And so when people come up to me and say, oh, isn't that good for Republicans? And I say, yeah, it's better than not. But here's what it doesn't take into consideration. 
if the Democrats and Republicans have about the same motivation to vote, the Democrats have 850,000 more active registered voters in the state. You hear what I just said? What's that mean? There are over a million lead the D's have, but because you can't remove people from the rolls as easier as you used to, I don't have to tell you folks more, and you know more about that than I do. That's what you do for a living here. When you think about it, when you think about it, that gives the Democrats an edge because there are just so many more active Democrats. And I'll get to the Pennsylvania situation in a minute. So all things being even, this election this year is far more about the President of the United States than any midterm election, at least in scientific polling. And perhaps you may have to go back to Roosevelt and the New Deal, who knows, maybe you have to go back to a guy named Abraham Lincoln and the Civil, American Civil War, but you, but you get the point. All right, let's go to the, uh, to the next issue. One of the things that we look at very, very carefully is voter enthusiasm. And the Democrats held a big lead in virtually all of the polls when it comes to voter enthusiasm. In the special congressional elections that were held all year, and we had a pretty big one out in the 18th CD in our state with Connor Lamb, who won a victory in a district that President Trump won by 20 points. And I will come back to an aspect of that in a minute. Now, the Republicans have certainly done better now closing the enthusiasm gap, but the difference, the difference is it depends on this ticket splitting aspect, particularly in our state, and whether Republicans are more likely to split the ticket than Democrats. For example, Scott Wagner, you know that guy? Yeah. Scott Wagner gets low single digits of Democrats who will split their tickets and vote for him. Governor Wolf pushes 20%, 20% of Republicans who are willing to vote for him. You get it? And the same is true to a lesser extent for, for Senator Casey. So now let's move to the next point and then I'll, I'll talk about, well, I'll get to our congressional elections. And, uh, 1992, historically considered the year of the woman it's going to pale into significance compared to what we see this year. There are, uh, there are somewhere over 300 women running for uh, the 435 congressional seats. Half, almost half the Democratic candidates are female. Half the Democratic are female. At the end of the day, there will be more than 100 women in the United States House of Representatives. They're currently 84. It's slightly less than 20%. And in our state, we haven't had a female in the congressional delegation, I think, since Allison Schwartz left to run in that multi-democratic field primary in, in 2014, ultimately won by Tom Wolf, now Governor Wolf. In our state, Oh, we've never elected in Pennsylvania a woman governor or a woman United States senator. That, that has to sink in when you think about it. Eight women are now on the ballot in Pennsylvania. Seven Ds and one R. At the end of the day, there will at least be three women and perhaps four in our 18-person congressional delegation, and I think that's a record number for the state of Pennsylvania. So we'll see how that ultimately plays out, but that's, uh, and another factor that we're looking at is the gender gap. Women increasingly are voting Democratic, and I'll tell you by, by demographics who. Let's forget about, let's not talk about African Americans because they're overwhelmingly men and women are Democrats. But if you go to white, female, white, female, college-educated voters, they have, with each passing election, they have been increasingly voting Democratic. We could see a gender gap approaching 20 to 25 points. Women voting Democrat, men voting Republican. And I wouldn't rule out 25 points. 
One of the reasons a guy named Connor Lamb won the special election out in the 18th in our state and why other Democrats did well in the special congressional elections held all year, even if they didn't win in, in districts that Trump had carried by 15 or 20 points, is something that's not been widely reported that's going on. White, college-educated, female Republicans in this election cycle has been, have been voting, more of them than ever before, voting Democratic. And that's why Connor Lamb won this special election. Washington, uh, Washington County, Westmoreland County, you know, not pretty even, even though, but you get the, the so southern part of Allegheny County, a disproportionate number of college-educated female voters, Republican voters, you know what they did? They voted for Connor Lamb and allowed him to win by a couple of thousand votes. So we'll see how that plays out in at least one of the congressional districts we're watching pretty carefully, and I don't have to tell you, it's not too far away from here in Bucks County, the first congressional district. All right, let's, let's move on to Congress. Most, all, four, all four of the analysts that, and, and the prognosticators that I mentioned to you before believe the Democrats will pick up the 23 seats. Larry Sabato this week got a little squishy. <laughs> he said it's likely to occur, but he wouldn't. But if it didn't, there was a scenario out there where that could occur. But the others think that the Democrats, and here's the range, somewhere between 20, it was earlier 25 and 38 seats. They need 23. Now they're kind of pushing back a little bit, and the average probably looks more like 27 to 35, you get it? One of the reasons the Democrats have an advantage is 45 House Republican seats are open, twice as many as for the Democrats. 23 congressional elections are being held in districts represented by a Republican member of Congress, but Hillary Clinton carried two years ago. So, and here's the other point, a good many of the districts are in the suburbs, and now we're back into this argument about what's going on in the suburbs of our cities, especially when you take a look at uh, the suburbs of Philadelphia, the suburbs around Washington. You can go all through the country where the suburban congressional districts could make the difference between whether the Democrats actually pick up. In this state, when I was talking about women earlier, the four, three women more likely than not will represent the Philadelphia suburbs in the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth congressional districts. And Susan Wilde up in the seventh congressional district is likely to win there. So we could have, as I indicated before, four women. I'm making the point about the suburbs and the changes that are going on with suburban voters. More college-educated voters live in the suburbs than anywhere else in, the, in, in our state and in many other states, many other states as well. So Pennsylvania is one of a half a dozen states that are likely to be determinative. 18 seats now in, in our delegation. The Supreme Court, as I don't have to tell you, repeat this, re declared the 2011 map unconstitutional. In the previous decade, the Democrats had more members of Congress than Republicans. In 2012, the first election that took place under the 2011 map, 18 seats. We had 19 before, we lost one. Oh, you'll like this. Pennsylvania had 36 members of Congress in the 1930s. See what's going on with the population shift and our slow growth and their big growth in the southeast and particularly out in the southwest. So, now what the hell was I talking about? Uh, I, I, I get off in all these segues and have no, and no, no, clue, no, no clue where I'm going. At any rate, in 2012, the Republicans grabbed 13 of the 18, the Democrats five. In 2014, the Republicans grabbed 13, the Democrats five. In 2016, the Republicans grabbed 13, uh, you get it, the five. Now it's 12-6 because uh, 
Connor, Connor Lamb won the, uh, the special election out in what, what is now the 18th, which goes away under its current uh, uh, boundary line change. So, so Pennsylvania, it looks like, will send somewhere between three and five Democrat, additional Democrats into, into the Congress of the United States and will play a major role. There are two districts that we're really paying close attention to. One is the first, and I'm not going to into great details about that. Uh, Representative Fitzpatrick, who, of course, his brother had been in there before. He's a former FBI agent running against a zillionaire, uh, Scott Wallace, who has a, something of a controversial uh, global fund that, among other people, with other, he manages, and that's been in some controversy. That is nip and tuck in the latest polls. It could go either way, either way. Here's what's fascinating. <coughs> Representative Fitzpatrick is a quintessential old style moderate Republican. He voted against repeal of the Affordable Care Act. He's got this, he's for gun control, so he has the support of folks that support gun control. He's got support of conservation groups. And imagine this. Public and private sector unions have endorsed him. <coughs> private and, and in our state, the spending in that district will exceed every other congressional, not collectively, but individually, every congressional district. Last time they put out numbers, seven million bucks came from outside the state. Now, we don't have to explain, I gotta be careful, no one's here from ABC6, right, Mike? <laughs> At any rate, Philadelphia television commercials is, aren't cheap. <laughs> You're paying a lot of money, you get it, because of the size of the market, obviously, and the reach, and the reach of, the, uh, of the TV. And so that race is being followed very, very closely nationally. And it's the size of the wave, and I'm gonna qualify that. Remember what I said, both parties are about equal in terms of now the interest in voting. Democrats have more. But Republicans are ticket splitting more than Democrats. You see where all this starts to come into play when you try to figure this all out? And at the end of the day, if there's what I call a deep blue wave, maybe even a moderate blue wave, Wallace wins. If it's a trickle, <laughs> and Fitzpatrick hopes it's a trickle, blue wave, then he could prevail. And there's no way to know with any certainty what's likely to happen there. We have a district that I won't get into out where I live in South Central PA. It's a, on the other side of that river, the Susquehanna River. And that district was reconfigured and a very safe Republican seat represented by, by a guy named uh, Scott Perry. That he's in, in a tough race as well. And the same factors that I talked about will we'll play out there. So overall, right now, most of the experts say the House will go Democratic, but uh, I, you, know, you just have to wonder, given lots of different things that are going on, whether that takes place. The Senate is exactly the opposite. The Senate is exactly the opposite. It's 51-49, R over D, because many, oh, this is, this is the way to think about it. 35 Senate seats up. The Democrats only have to defend 26. The Republicans, nine. Of the 26 the Democrats are defending, 10 of them are in states won by President Trump. Five of them by double digits. Here's one of my segues. I'll look at the political scientist over here. You can't believe, every now and then when you get a report about how, how somebody does in an election, and oh, somebody won by 10 points. You roll your eyes and say, wow, that's pretty big. How about 20 points? 20, somebody won by 20 points? How about 30 points? No way, no how. How about 40? A guy named Joe Manchin, uh, 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 who's the senator up for re-election, lives in a state, West Virginia, that Donald Trump carried by 42 points. 
I wonder why he was the only Democrat to vote for the confirmation of, what was that guy's name? <laughs> to, the, to the Supreme Court, you get it? We wonder why he did that, even though the real clear politics average, I looked at that, he was up by nine points. And probably likely to win, but he wasn't going to take any, but you know, it was because he believed, uh, never mind. <laughs> I won't pursue that anymore. So you, and there's a variety of seats, I won't get into them in detail, in Indiana and North Dakota and Missouri, where it looks like, and who knows what's going to go on in that crazy thing uh, in New Jersey, I and mean, we won't even touch that race where anything can happen, and there are one or two others. On the other hand, the Republicans have to worry about Arizona, Nevada, and Tennessee, and we'll see how that all goes. But right now, all the prognosticators, every single one of them, the big four, believe that the Senate is likely to remain Republican and the Republicans could pick up one or two seats. So lastly, let me turn to our statewide elections. Governor Tom Wolf has this huge double-digit lead and he's running against a guy named Scott Wagner. They're both from York County. Actually, the Democratic vice presidential nominee's family lives in York. I have no clue what's that about. I get asked that all, like, is there something in the water? Is there something going on in York? The answer is no. There's one word, coincidence. There's no deep-rooted factor. And we've had Democratic and Republican gubernatorial candidates come from the same county several, several times in just recent past. But moving on, the, the problem that Scott Wagner has, and it's true if you analyze elections, whenever you run against an incumbent, you have to go to the voters with something that matters to them and say, throw this guy out, throw that gal out. And Wagner doesn't have anything. There's no big issue that the voters identify as to why they don't like Wolf and why they want him removed. Nothing. The things that Wagner has talked about just don't gel. He often talks about, well, the governor let three budgets become law without his signature. And I roll my eyes and say, okay. Now, I'm sure that's kitchen table talk conversation. <laughs> Everybody's going to get up and sit around and say, oh, you know the governor didn't sign three budgets? And what do we know about those three budgets? Was there a single state worker on leave, you know, forced leave? Was there a single, single state service not being provided? Could you go get a driver's license? Could you go knock on the door of PennDOT? Well, I don't want to go there. And ask them if they could come out. No, everything. So there was no disruption to any service during the three of those budgets. And the single most important issue for the Corbett years and into the early years of Governor Wolf was education. And you know what the Republican controlled legislature did for the governor in his reelection year and their own? $33 billion budget, almost a 3% hike. The biggest increase was $1 billion in new money for basic education, K through 12, special ed increased. So they actually helped the governor by taking away the one issue that might have, even though he called for increases throughout the year. Wagner also says, what about income and sales tax hikes? The governor wanted income and sales tax hikes. That's true. In his first two budgets, the legislature didn't do them. So you can talk about anything, but when you go to look at an incumbent's record or why you should vote him out, and he didn't put those recommendations in his next two budgets. And he did put a tax in his all four budgets that's popular. I've pulled on it and everybody else has pulled on it. And it's severance tax. And that tax is very, very popular, even though the Republicans in the legislature aren't, aren't going to approve it. So the bottom line, and, and let me go to something else. Scott Wagner is not exactly been uncontroversial. Uh, as candidates go, he's not just supports Trump, but he has a Trump-like style and personality about him. And for some that's good and some that's bad. And then uh, as people have gotten to know him over the last month, as people have gotten to recognize him and to know him, his popularity has dropped. There's a relationship. I think some of it has to do with a comment that I, I, I just couldn't believe. He told Governor Wolf, 
he needed to put on a catcher's mask because he was going to stomp on his face with golf spikes. And I looked at this, and no, the only thing I thought of was not how, was it horrendous or not. I thought, hell, this guy doesn't play golf because we don't wear spikes anymore. <laughs> that at least if he wants to talk about golf spikes, he ought to know, you know. But seriously, now, when he got elected to the state senate uh, four, five years ago, I guess, now, you know what he said? He was going to take a baseball bat and go out and clean up this, the legislative chambers. Do I believe he meant violence? No. But you and I both know in this in horrific environment with all the violence, look what the pipe bomber, look at that horrific a shooting that took place by that whack job out, and I won't mention his name. I will not mention these people's name. I'm not going to give at, at the at the synagogue in Squirrel Hill. The fact of the matter is that it's inappropriate. I'll be mild about it to say that. And so throughout this campaign, it's not gelled. Tom Wolf has raised four times as much money. Now Wagner's a zillionaire. He could easily have put 10 million in his own campaign. The last reporting period, he had less than two million bucks on hand. Now, you're seeing more and more of his commercials, right? They're out there. But overall, Wolf has enough of a record, even with the Republican Congress, to go to the voters. And the other thing, here's what I love as a follower of many campaigns. Wolf is doing what a lot of incumbents do. Rendell, Ed Rendell majored in it. He's going around to different groups because of the legislature and the budget. You can't have this. Handing this out to every group he can find. Well, here's four, here's four million dollars for this fund, you got it? And so when asked, he says, there's an election? There, no, I'm serious. There's a campaign? He goes, there's, I'm running? What's going He doesn't even want to come close to even mention Wagner. He has a big lead, so he's not going to open up anything. Well, let's finally go to, what's that guy's name? Oh, Bob Casey, Senator Casey, and uh, Lou Barletta. Let's talk about Lou Barletta. If you want a referendum on the President of the United States in a Senate election, mm -hmm. I want you to go to 35 other, 34 other races and try to find one where you have a Senate candidate closer to the President. Hell, he was Trump before Trump was Trump on immigration <laughs> When he, was mayor of Hazel, when he was mayor of Hazel and sued the federal government and, uh, you know, for its immigration policies and went through all that. But here's something else. He was one of the first members of Congress to endorse the president. Number two, he co-chaired his campaign in this state. Number three, he was on the transition team. Number four, and now I know it'll never go out of this room. <laughs> he was offered the job as Secretary of Labor and turned it down. Trump's been here twice for him, Pence once. And I, I tried to find some policy difference. I actually did it myself. I didn't have one of my interns do it. So I was out doing all this research. I said, what, what did they disagree on? I found one little thing on education spending. And you know, Trump has not exactly been consistent. He's changed his mind on a few things. When he changes his mind, Lou Barletta changes his mind. So. I'm, I'm being half facetious, but candid about it, and it's just the nature of, of who this guy is. And I'm not criticizing. He can support the president all he wants. That's fine. I'm merely saying, if you want a referendum on the president of the United States, you got it. You have it in this race. Now, Senator Casey, well, let me go through the biography. Senator Casey has been elected statewide five times. Twice as Auditor General, once as Treasurer, and twice as U.S. Senator. They weren't even contests. They weren't even close. Now I know it's all about the dad, and I hear this all the time. Bob Casey, the governor, you know, had this storied name, and Bob Jr. comes along and wins. That probably helped him at the beginning. But I think now, it's, at this point, you know, it, it's, it's not a factor. So Bob Casey, here's, here's the difference between a, a woman named Hillary Clinton and Bob Casey. Senator Casey has emerged as one of the top five Democratic Senate critics of the president. I'm on all their email lists. I can't, every day, five of them from the Casey campaign or their office saying something they don't like about the president. 
But you know, there's something he and the president agree on, and it relates to why President Trump won the presidency. Oh man, you're gonna say, where the hell's he going with this one? <laughs> Try this on. Senator, when, when the President of the United States won the electoral votes of Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin, largely because his campaign developed a strategy that we call the Rust Belt strategy. They identified white working class voters, men and women, high school educations or less, who could tip four states in their favor. Ours, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin. So the president developed this series of issues that he brought to the campaigns, particularly in four states. Get rid of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, get rid of NAFTA. These trade deals are bad. You know who they're bad for? The working class men and women in the old industrial areas of those four states. Our state led the way. Coal, iron, steel, lead, paint, you can go through all of them. These, out in the southwestern part of our state, up in the northeastern part of our state, anthracite coal up there, bituminous coal out there. The fact of the matter is, these counties in those regions all have Democratic voter registration edges. Let's go out to Green, Beaver, Washington, Westmoreland, Fayette, Cambria, are you impressed that I can name all of them? <laughs> every one of them has a Democratic voter registration edge and every one of them voted for Donald Trump. You know what, no, no, the other place that didn't, I'm stunned by this. Of all places, Erie, Pennsylvania. Now those voters have been moving away from the Democrats for a decade or so. I never thought in my lifetime Erie, Pennsylvania would send a Republican state senator to Harrisburg. Johnstown, Pennsylvania would send a Republican. You get it? I never thought I'd see that because of their old Democratic roots coming out of the New Deal at the FDR years. But these voters out there voted for Trump largely because he, he talked about trade. He talked unfair trade deals. He talked about bringing back coal, bringing back steel. He talked about tariffs. And guess who else supported him on those things? One Senator Bob Casey. Even though he just, and Casey, Casey's dad, I'm sorry, his grandfather was a coal miner. And his dad represented coal mine owners. Senator Casey has kept ties and connections with the voters out there. You know who didn't? Hillary. She couldn't find Manessa. She did one tour. And you know who spent time out there? President Trump. I'll, I'll put it this way, in another way. Take the Susquehanna River, where I live, nearby where I live. Two thirds of the geography west of the Susquehanna River, one third of the geography east, Population two-thirds east, one-third west. Rural and small towns for the most part. Hillary Clinton carried two counties west of the Susquehanna River. You know that center county with that strange RE instead of ER? Translation State College, Allegheny County, Translation Pittsburgh. And that tells you something about the nature of the voting changes that are taking place. Now the mid-state area and up across the New York border, that small town and rural in particular, they're, they're Republican. Out in the Southwest now, do you know that, that Donald Trump carried Luzerne County by over 30,000 votes? You know, he almost carried Lackawanna County. I think he uh, lost it by two, 3,000 votes, that's all. So here's something else. And you shouldn't get me started on this. Here's something else. Bob, the Democratic Party is now the party of urban America. The Republican Party has now become the party of small town and rural America, and they fight over the burbs. Think of the people who live in the cities versus the people who live in small towns. Demographically and in terms of the issues that they support. Look at the people who live in cities like Philly and New York and Chicago, you pick them. They're much more diverse. Immigrants, legal and illegal. Millennials 
hate the, I, but I gotta be careful until I, or I'll get into real trouble back on campus. I'll put it this way. Millennials love urban life. <laughs> they're very mobile, you got it? And they're culturally very liberal. Culturally, people in the cities are culturally liberal. Gay rights, transgender issues, abortion, oh, gun control, the use of the government, you know, to make a difference in people's lives. And you go out in this small town in rural Pennsylvania, I don't, or I don't care, go to other states as well, and what do you find? A very different demographic and a very different set of issues. You better not touch those guns out there in rural and small town PA. Big Second Amendment rights people. And they're not crazy over gay rights or they're not crazy over abortion. I can go through all these issues. The population tends to be whiter and older with high school educations or less. So there's some demographic. Now I'm generalizing about it. So what basically happened was Hillary won down here not just a little bit. She won all four, all four suburban counties in 2000 and and uh, 12 in his re-election bid, Obama didn't carry Chester County. But Hillary carried all five. On election night, I'll never forget this. I looked at the results from Philly and the Burbs because they come in earlier than the rural counties. I thought, oh my God, Hillary won. You know what I didn't get? That Donald Trump won 29 Pennsylvania counties by 69, 70% of the vote. And so it wasn't that they he, she didn't win the votes here, it's that he won the votes in most of the other counties and the percentage that he was winning by was, was huge, huge. And, and to go back to Senator Casey, Casey's kept connections and ties. I don't know if he's gonna win the Southwest, it looks like he might, but he's, oh, how about this? Casey's an exception in a variety of ways. He's from Scranton. Nobody accused Scranton of being urban. <laughs> if you've ever been there, it's a real working class town. You know, it's a little different kind of town than you would find where I live in, you know, in Lancaster or York or Harrisburg or Reading or Allentown or obviously in Philly. So Senator Casey's position is very consistent on most issues with the Democrats and both he he and Wolf, both he and Wolf, are taking advantage in some ways of the economy, which Trump has not been able to for reasons that I explained. So when you sit down and you look at all this, it doesn't shock me that Casey and Wolf have double digit leads. Again, 850,000 more active, you know, registered, blah, blah, blah. You got Democrats more likely to cast straight party voters. Straight party tickets statewide, Republicans, you got it, more likely to split their tickets. And you've got a recipe. Now, lastly, I talked about Congress, I gotta talk about the legislature. 121 R's right now out of 203. At the end of the day, the state house will stay Republican. The Republicans could lose six, seven, eight at the most nine seats. All right, you need 102 to organize the chamber. That's the working majority. The, the, I would be stunned if they're below 110. Stunned. The Senate, Republicans have 34. Half the Senate seats are up. 34 senators. They call that veto proof. It takes 26 to organize the chamber. So they lose two or three, perhaps down here more likely than anywhere else, although there's a seat or two out in the West. So they end up at the worst case scenario with 30. The last time I looked, that was still a majority in both chambers. And so we'll have a conservative legislature and a liberal governor back for four more years <laughs> of the same situation that Harris, for those of, and I know you pay, again, pay a lot of attention to what goes on in Harrisburg, so it looks likely to stay the same. All right, I can do some questions or I can go home. <laughs> yes, go ahead. I have a question. Uh, what's going on with the uh, employment supposedly soaring to be great except in Pennsylvania? Well, the Pennsylvania economy is a little more complicated because it still has a lot of its structural roots 
in the old industrial economy, particularly in the rural and small town areas where jobs, there, there are relatively few jobs and relatively few companies that uh, have settled in those regions. So we're still in some respects caught up in the past. When kids graduate from high school, and my fellow colleague professors over here I think will understand that, if they graduate from small towns, and they get to go to college, they'll go to college, but they won't go back to the small towns. You know, they'll end up having to find employment because there just aren't the kinds of jobs. And here's what's also fascinating. Now, economists are telling me that there are far more openings for jobs than there, than there are, according to them, qualified people to take the positions. And that has changed, obviously, since the Great Recession. And that's matching up the skills, the skills, the educational backgrounds of people to fill those, fill those needs. And that remains, I think, a pretty big, a pretty big challenge. We, uh, the economy in the state has certainly improved. But you're right, GDP growth and unemployment were still above the, uh, were still above the national average. Go, go ahead. But has it improved for the minimum wage worker? Uh, well, I understand. Have they seen it in their... Uh, well, the, the last report I... There was just a report out yesterday that said that more workers have received raises and the raises have been larger. I forget what the decade... 20 or 30 years... Than 30 or 20 or 30 years ago. So we are starting to see some improvement. I'm not suggesting at the... Yeah, at, at that level. And there'll be a big debate in the legislature about raising our minimum wage. But as you know, the Republicans control, they've been unwilling to do. Governor Wolf has called for that on a number of occasions. I don't see the Republican controlled legislature. I, its composition is going to be pretty much the same. It's not going to change ideologically uh, very much with a handful of people. Um, you know, we'll have to see what happens. Uh, back there, go ahead. I recently read that the uh, lack of immigrants is hurting the mushroom uh, yes. business in, the, in Pennsylvania. Yeah. You mean because no one else yeah. will do that work? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, the farmers were also deeply hurt, in the, particularly in milk. People that, you know, that I've chatted with have complained. Farmers, e even with the arrangements made in NAFTA, that they feel they're still being hurt from competition and the prices. And of course, Canadians selling automobiles, you know, it's gotten very complicated with the NAFTA thing. But there are certain segments of the agricultural community that you're, you're right, that uh, and I'm not an expert on the mushroom industry by any stretch, but I generally understand that to be true, that there are parts of the agriculture. I hear mostly about dairy from, dairy from dairy farmers. Go ahead. What names are you seeing coming up for the 2020 presidential? On the Democratic side? We don't have time to go into all of them. <laughs> I mean, how many U.S. senators, how many Democratic U.S. senators will we get running? 30? No, there aren't 30. But you get, oh my gosh. Uh, but let me just make an observation. There are, two, there are two interesting struggles that are going to go on in the Democratic Party. They're playing out a bit now, but wait until November 7th. And particularly when we get into the uh, primaries and the caucuses, uh, for the 2020 president, here's what they are. Generational. The Demo some Democrats are arguing it's time for a Demo uh, generational change. Translation, goodbye Hillary, goodbye Joe. Both of whom might run for the presidency, as I think everybody in this room knows. The second one is ideological. With a number of the Democratic senators Right, a certain senator from Massachusetts. We're still trying to figure out her genealogy. <laughs> that, that wasn't a, that wasn't the smartest thing I think any, that she did during her career. But you get it: Kirsten Gillibrand, Cory Booker, Kamala Harris. We got the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. The progress. I do that all the time. Don't worry about it. The progressive wing of the Democratic Party versus what I'll call the center-left Democrats. You with me? 
And many of the, many, uh, many, particularly the females running for Congress there are quote progressives. And so that agenda, whether we're talking about Medicare for all, whether we're talking about don't build the wall, whether we're talking about something we like, free college education, uh, but you get it. College, and some put a, a financial limit on 125,000 or less, you can go, some say public versus private. So there's an agenda there that the, that the moderate Democrats, what I call center left Democrats, will not be wild about. That's more represented by a generational change as well. So the Democrats, through the struggle for their ultimate nominee, I think are going to go through, a, could go through a pretty big ideological battle, depending on who runs. Now, if Biden doesn't run and Hillary doesn't run, you know, we might not see that play out the, the, the way it is. Biden has the lead right now when they're matched up, but the voters of the country don't know these individual U.S. senators that will take up, you know, uh, the process to figure out. Go ahead. Is Bernie Sanders dead in the water for 2020? I think so. See, there's another generational gap or generational change problem. But, you know, predicting now what's likely to happen is a fool's errand. I've been a fool many times, so, <laughs> and I've predicted many times. Am I going to get out of here? Or are you just going to ask me a million questions? Go ahead, Jack. Do you know anything about the uh, integrity of the vote when people have close rates? Well, we're going through all of this business again. We know that th we know that there was considerable meddling in the election. And what we don't know, and you may not agree with me on this, but there's no evidence yet about substantial collusion. But we know there was hacking, and we know that that Bureau of, the election bureaus throughout the country are working on making sure that the machinery that gets used is security proof. If you're not online, that's a big way to go. In Pennsylvania, that's true. But then you've got the paper trail problem. So I think we'll be better off than we were two years ago. I'm not convinced that we'll be completely free. Now again, you folks in this organization pay a lot more attention to that. I don't think you can rule out. We know already, particularly the, the federal, our federal government has identified the Chinese as being actively involved right now. And so we'll have to see what kind of meddling and hacking takes place. But it is a problem and it continues to, and I forget the amount of money you'll know that the federal government sent to the states. I just did it, there's, it's a pretty, a hundred and some million, but sent out over, you know, 50 states and the District of, I don't know that that'll be enough. And that'll be something that'll have to be worked on, I think. Go ahead. How much do you think the millennials are going to affect? <laughs> well, we have record number of millennials that have registered to vote in some states. And in the polls, they are showing an interest in voting. Typically, they have an age cohort the lowest. Uh, if they get, who knows, 22, 25% in the past have not been uncommon. Uh, I, I, I don't, it looks like they're, they're, they're going to turn out in higher proportions. But guess what? What happens if every, every group turns out in higher proportions? Because it's going to be a bigger turnout. It might not make as big a difference as you think. What do you, th you think they're going to vote? Political scientists right there. I know I'm going to vote. <laughs> yeah, but you get... Yeah, I, I think. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of activity on college campuses for a midterm, more than I've seen. Yeah, I, I'm I'm the administrator of FNM's Harvard I'll name drop, the Harvard Institute of Politics, and they just had a big meeting about you know college campuses. We have something called FNM votes. I don't know if you all have something on your campuses to encourage students to register. These are nonpartisan. They're not partisan groups, they're just getting the kids, and many of them are out of state, so you know where that leads, getting that all worked out. But I do think millennials are more likely than not to have a higher turnout. The fact is that we all will have a higher turnout. There seems to be greater interest in the African American community this year. The Hispanic community in our state, I've not heard very much about. I think that might be in doubt. 
All right, how many? Oh, I'll go back there. Go ahead. After the 2016 election, we heard a lot about shaky news sources. About what? Shaky news sources <laughs> where people were getting information. Do you think people have shifted their sources for information about the Look, the yeah, the question has to do with where people get their information from. Here, here's something, and I uh, talk about this all the time. Number one, Virtually everyone now goes to a news source that agrees that, that, that agrees with them and, they, and vice versa. So if you're a Democrat, you're going to watch MSNBC or CNN and you're going to listen to NPR and you're going to read the New York Times and the Washington Post. If you're a Republican, you're going to watch Fox News, you're going to listen to Rush Limbaugh, and you're going to read the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal. And never the middle shall meet. And social media is the same. Increasingly, by the way, the people who watch TV news and who uh, read newspapers are diminishing. And more and more people are getting their, in, in, I can't find it, in, information from this. Uh, many people think the president ought to get rid of this, but I don't think that's going to happen. You got it? So. I, I used to, I'm not in a classroom now, but I told students for years, and it won't apply exactly, I have an obligation to watch Chris Matthews. I'm using that euphemist, you know, not a name drop, I know him. You know, he ran for Congress in 1974. He's a Philadelphia guy. And then I have an obligation to flip the Fox and watch Bill O'Reilly. Now I'd have to say Tucker Carlson. So I flip around. And I'm a, you know, I listen to NPR, but I also listen to conserv not Rush, but the other some conservatives, you know, fo Dom Giordano down here, right? So there's plenty of people to listen to to get a variety of views, so you understand, and you're not getting the viewpoint from the other ideological center from the people who agree with you. That's not the, the best way to do it, but. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm winning that battle. And that's, that's a serious problem right now. And it also continues the hyperpolarization. All right, I'll do two more. Did you ask a question before? <laughs> Go ahead. How and where do you get the people you poll? Oh, yeah. well, that's easy. There are, or, there are companies that supply us lists of registered voters. We use one called Labels and Lists. It has every registered voter in the state. You with me? So the folks at Center for Opinion Research that do the survey for my center pluck out, let's just say for the sake of this discussion, 3,000 names. These are people who are randomly selected. So every one of them is eligible to be called. So in order to reach people, a letter goes out to 3,000 people who the interviewers want to reach and it says, you know, you've been selected to be interviewed by Franklin Marshall College, blah, blah, blah. Here's an 800 number. You can call us between these hours. Oh, by the way, here's a link. You can take the poll online. Now, remember, these are people we would interview anyway. And or we'll call you. And it has cell phone numbers as well as hardline numbers. No one picks up a hardline number anymore if you don't recognize it. No, I mean, you pick up your phone with a number that you don't recognize. No, nobody does that. <laughs> and cell phones, if you're calling somebody on a cell phone, or what the hell are you calling me for? I'm in a movie. Or what are you calling me for? I'm in a shopping. You know what I mean. You're out doing something. And then they'll make arrangements to say, well, when can we call you? What's a good time? So it's not easy. And that's called response rate. And response rates, of, when I, we started my first poll in 1991, when Harris Wofford and Dick Thornburg ran for a big U.S. Senate race. Thornburg had been governor and, of course, U.S. attorney. And I, we produced a poll at Millersville with, oh, you know, I, I shouldn't say this. At Millersville University, because the state owned, we couldn't pay people from the outside, so we had to use students. So we required freshman gov we, we required students who were taking freshman gov to do two interviewing sessions as part of the research methodology part of freshman gov. <laughs> but you know what? They liked it. 
they got into it and actually liked it. And they turned out that they were pretty good interviewers. So to make a long story short, uh, when the problem is that response rates, uh, we were getting 60, 65 percent of the people we were trying to reach out of the pool. Now it's below 10. So that means a lot of statistical adjustments called weighting that you have to apply. Now some academic studies say that the response rates aren't, aren't a problem. But here's the bottom line. Within five to 10 years, you know what we're gonna do? They're all gonna be online. The polls I don't like are IVR, inter interactive voice recording where you pick up the phone and a machine talks to you. Punch this number, punch that. We have live interviewers and they can get a sense about who you are and ask the questions in, a, in the appropriate way. But it's tough, the polling industry, we, 27 years, we were wrong in our state in 2016. That was the first poll that we hadn't, didn't have the right winner, usually within some margin of error. Yeah. It's not easy and I'm always fearful about what's going to happen on November 6th. <laughs> All right, I'll do one more, and then I'm, uh, you, uh, go ahead, ma'am. Um, have you done any research on the um, elimination of the Electoral College? Oh, uh, the question is eliminating the Electoral College. First of all, the voters in America want it eliminated. I've written about it and don't think it's necessary anymore. Oh my gosh, do you know what you have to do to eliminate it? It's called something little, like a constitutional amendment. The last time I checked the Constitution, two-thirds of the House and the Senate, and you know how many states? Three-fourths. <laughs> that is not likely to happen. And here's the problem with it. I think a lot of voters cast votes and they don't even understand that there's an electoral college out there. And there's no sense of its importance. We've had, by my count, five presidents who've been elected by the Electoral College, but didn't secure a majority of the popular vote. Hell, we've had two, what, Bush in 2000, and uh, what's that guy's name? Oh, Trump. Uh, you know, he lost the popular vote by 2.9 million votes. That's about 2.2 percentage. And uh, that's why I think a lot of, well, the, Many reasons why the why Democrats don't rec you know accept this legitimacy. Go ahead. I, I had heard that the states were taking it upon themselves, and that that was another alternate way. To go. Yeah, yeah. There's something I forget the exact name of it now. Where once they get to a majority of the electoral college, what they're saying is that they will cast their electoral votes in that state for the popular vote winner. Do you know what the name of that is? The National Popular Vote. That's right, very good, the National Popular Vote. And there's still uh, uh, some states short of it, but we'll see where that goes. Now remember, that's done by the states, and you know they'd have to deal with the electors and how each state would deal with the selection of electors and all that, but that's, uh, that's something that could for more or less force, but we'll have to see. At any rate, I'm out of here. Thank you very much. <laughs>